Hello, everyone. Welcome back to OTD Military History. Today, we are going a little bit further back than we typically do. We are going to be looking at the time period uh, at the end of the 18th century, so 1790s-ish. We're going to be getting into a whole bunch of events right now. Not an area I know a ton about my self, but I've uh, been learning and, and, and connecting with the author and writer today uh, and learning from him and him directing me to some stuff inadvertently, uh, doing my own kind of digging. But uh, we have Rob Thompson on today to talk about The Wind from All Directions, which is his novel that he's written about the Nanooktuk crisis. So I'm going to let Ron explain all that, but that's kind of what we're going to be looking at today. So if you have questions, which I'm sure you will, because I'm going to um, fire away and uh, we'll get moving from there. So thanks for coming on the uh, channel, Ron. I really appreciate it. Pleasure, Brad. Yeah, it's uh, it's great to have, uh, like I said, a topic we don't, our time period typically not covered here. So I'm trying to expand and do some different stuff. So this is a this is a very different one for us, and we love that and something different. We're all big history nerds here. So <laughs> as I like to ask, uh, how did how did one come to talk about this particular topic and then want to write a historical novel about it? Yeah. So. My, my interest in this began way back when, when I trained with the Canadian Navy on the West Coast. I was a, a young officer cadet um, in Esquimalt. And uh, I, during my training, we navigated and you know sailed uh, all through the Canadian waters and the Pacific seaboard. Um, I just became, I've always been interested in history and I just became very interested in who were the first people in these waters? Like what, mm -hmm. how, how were they discovered? Uh, they're heavily indented fjorded uh, waters uh, it, it was uh, unknown uh, when they first arrived and i just started to uh, be fascinated by that and did some digging and i came upon cook's uh, cook's voyage in the northwest and then vancouver and of course vancouver's name is everywhere on the west coast and um, i started to dig further into who george vancouver was and i found some really interesting um, uh, details about his voyage, his five-year voyage on the West Coast. Cool. Yeah. I mean, it's it, it's not one I, I'll know generally, not known too much about, particularly in Canada, and I'd fair to say the United States as well, even though that area now is, is, is straddles the border between the two countries and yes. obviously quite important to those areas being part of both countries now and, and having a, a rich history and a quite a few number of uh, different groups involved. So we're going to need your help to... Uh, Keep all that, uh, keep all that straight. So we have uh, uh, some photos and things like that prepared. Or sorry, paintings, obviously not photos <laughs> for all that. So uh, you can take it away from there, Ron. Okay. Well, uh, thanks, Brad. And as as Brad mentioned, uh, I am I wrote a novel. I'm not an historian, but I've uh, I've set it in. It's set in Nootka Sound in the fall of 1792, when Lieutenant George Vancouver, the Royal Navy, encountered. Spanish Commodore Bodegui Quadra. Um, they were there to resolve a diplomatic dispute. Um, and uh, uh, it was supposed to be the final act in the Nootka crisis. And it turned out to be uh, uh, a tense month in on the West Coast. Um, it's the setting for my book, but I thought I'd just give the background to how Quadra and Vancouver arrived there and, and the details behind the Nootka crisis, which is a little known today. It's also called the Spanish Armament because the Spanish, uh, the British uh, fleet was mobilized and went to sea, and um, the two countries came very close to uh, a hot war because of an incident that occurred in Nootka Sound in 1789. And so uh, I'll talk about the details of that, but um, it's a pretty it's a pretty sweeping canvas, or it's a it's a broad canvas and a sweeping story. So um, uh, can I can I Control the slides, Brad, or? Yeah, you should be able to, yeah. And if you uh, hit the arrow there at the bottom on the uh, little screen showing the slide. Oh, I see it. Got it. Okay. There you go. All right. <laughs> we're, we're cooking now. now so this, this is a map of the Pacific in 1754. And for those of you who are familiar with the, the features as we know them can see, there's the suggestion of, uh, of the features that we, we know today, but, um, it was very, it was very poorly known. The Pacific as a whole and the Pacific Northwest, um, it it had been allocated to the Spanish, 
by the Papal Bull of 1493, um, which split the world basically between the two Catholic uh, kingdoms of Portugal and Spain. So this was Spanish territory, but the Spanish for 300 years did nothing to find out what was there in the Pacific Northwest. Their focus was elsewhere, but um, also to um, um, to um, uh, well to to do anything there to to settle it or anything like that. Now you'll notice that the features are very vague. There are it's a very indented uh, um, coastline and. Everyone knew that there were channels going off into the interior and there were always legends about a passage that would take you to Europe. Um, it was called Maldonado's Passage. It was called the uh, Strait of Anian, the Strait of De, De, uh, De Fonte and the Strait of Juan de Fuca, which we, which we know today and is actually a, a strait which does not lead to Europe, but um, uh, was a teaser for the people at the time. Uh, it was named after a, um, an apocryphal Greek who said he entered it in the 1500s in the service of Spain and, and came out the other end in Europe. All legends, not much, no foundation at all, but those legends survived. Um, Spain did nothing at all to find out what was going on up there or exercise sovereignty until 1774, when it heard that the Russians and possibly the British were present in the region. So they, um, they uh, uh, thought they needed to find out what was going up there, and they commissioned a single frigate named the Santiago um, from the Spanish naval base on the Mexican coast in Pacific Mexican coast on San Blas. Uh, it was under the command of uh, a man named Juan Perez. He was to reconnoiter the coast up to 60 degrees north. Now, here's the ship he had, the, the uh, frigate Santiago, which was built in 1773 in, in Mexico, in St. Blas, had a crew of 86. It was a, a square rig three master. In January of 1774, it sailed north with supplies for the California settlements, stopped in Monterey, and then continued north on its mission. Now, it was subject to the winds, which are uh, prevailing northwesterly in that region. So they had to sail far out to the west often to far from the coast and then angle their way northeasterly uh, towards the continent. They coasted and whenever they could see the, the mountains in the distance, they would get a latitude and longitude and, and chart as best they could. But they were far out at sea for most of the voyage and uh, sightings were few. They, they sailed in January. By July, they were at 55 degrees north, which is the latitude of Haida Gwaii and they spotted land. It was indeed Haida Gwaii, and they went to anchor um, off one of the islands, and the Haida came off and met them. And this was the first encounter in Canadian waters, what became Canadian waters, between Europeans and Indigenous people. Um, the Haida came off, they traded, they presented gifts, there was a mutual exchange, it was all very respectful. Um, Perez did not land. It was the end of the season and they knew that they knew what the weather was like in the North Pacific. So Perez decided to return south. He'd made 55 degrees. Uh, in August, he was coasting along uh, at a large landmass and he anchored off uh, a large inlet. It was Nutka Sound on Vancouver Island. Again, he didn't land, but the Moachat who live uh, in, in that region came out to his ship in their canoes, uh, circled, um, traded. Um, they came aboard, they traded, there were gifts. It was a peaceful encounter once again. No, uh, no violence. It was a respectful nation to nation type of settlement, uh, type of uh, meeting. So again, these two first incidences of first contact in what became Canada. This year, it's 250 years since that first encounter. And uh, I've been trying to find out if there's any kind of commemoration expected uh, or planned. And it turns out there are none, apparently. The, this, uh, you know, it's a large number anniversary and unfortunately not much is happening. Um, that was 1774. 1775, the Spanish had learned a lot from Perez's voyage. One was about the suitability of ships for this type of mission. So um, this was a, a large three-master, square-rigged, um, deep draft, 
it was not good for coastal reconnaissance. And so the Spaniards um, sent commissioned it again to head north, but they gave it an escort vessel, a 36-foot schooner called the Sonora, which was uh, built in, uh, in Mexico. It was actually rumored to be a very swift and sure sailor, and it was used to sail from San Blas on the Mexican coast to Baja, California, which is fairly, fairly short uh, journeys. Um, they sailed in uh, March of 1775. Uh, by the way, the Sonora had a crew of 16, two officers okay. and uh, 14 men. Only four of them had been to sea before, the, the men. The rest were farm workers from Mexico. So not a lot of experience on the vessel. But they had uh, an extraordinary captain in the, in the person of this man. This is Juan Francisco de la Bodega y Quadra, who we'll see in Nootka Sound in 1792 with Vancouver. Um, Quadra was a Peruvian-born Basque uh, um, noble family descendant. Uh, he was a graduate of the Naval Academy in Cadiz, and he was 32 years old during, the, during this voyage. Uh, they, the two ships sailed north in March 75, and again, they were far out at sea um, because uh, of the winds uh, and, and the, uh, the prevailing westerlies. They, uh, they proceeded north. The voyage continued, and it soon became clear that the Sonora, which had been sold as a sure sailor, was a, a horrible vessel. It was slow. It was unstable. It nearly foundered twice in the North Pacific. Um, it was it was an unsafe vessel. Um, it also couldn't carry all the supplies that it needed. The uh, the, the sister ship, uh, the Santiago, had to uh, carry most of the supplies. So. Um, it was a problem from the get-go, uh, and both ships, it turned out, as they proceeded, were provisioned very poorly. Um, scurvy uh, emerged very, very soon uh, into the voyage. Uh, there was no mention of it in Perez's voyage, but on this voyage, it occurred very quickly. Mm. Um, there were juntas. Uh, at sea, the, the two ships, uh, the captain of uh, the Santiago, Bruno Hazetto, would uh, raise a flag the two ships would uh, come close and the officers would row over and there would be a junta or a meeting of the officers to talk about progress and issues. At one point, Hazetta wanted to send Sonora back to Mexico because it just, uh, you know, was holding them up. It could do about three knots under sail in a, in a middling wind. Um, Quadra was able to re-rig it and get a bit more speed out of it and his sailors became more proficient. Uh, at these juntas, he spoke against turning around um, and persuaded Hazetta that it was that that he should continue. They continued to the latitude of around the mouth of um, the Strait of Juan de Fuca, but but a hundred leagues, three hundred miles out in the Pacific. And at that point, they had another junta, and it was clear um, that not only was Sonora a problem, but Santiago was a problem, and the and health of the crew was a problem. So they had a meeting out at sea. And again, uh, now all the officers, except Quadra and his number two, uh, a pilot named Morel, all of them said we should turn back. Now, this was in July, late July, and Quadra convinced them that they should keep going. So uh, this, this man had a certain persuasive power. He was the junior officer of the, of the, of the two captains. They continued, and the weather changed they were separated at sea, and when when the visibility improved, there was no sign of the Santiago. So oh. Quadra find him, found himself alone at sea uh, with this 36-foot um, uh, hardly seaworthy vessel. Um, he thought that Hazetta must have realized that he was they were missing and separated and, and returned to, New, uh, to uh, New Spain. Quadra and his pilot both decided to continue. As, uh, as Quadra said, I, I'll paraphrase a little bit, I decided to continue taking trouble for granted. So they continued with the voyage. They were at the mouth of um, Juan de Fuca there. They were at about um, uh, 49 degrees latitude. It's pretty close to the present Canadian border. Um, they continued for another 10 degrees of, uh, of latitude. They got to 59 degrees, which is the latitude of Sitka in Alaska. Yeah. It was the farthest any ship had penetrated at that point. 
Um, the season was far advanced when they got there and, and they decided to turn around. Everyone had scurvy. Everyone was uh, uh, suffering from the cold and whatnot. They, they sailed south, returned to Monterey. And as I say, everyone had scurvy and everyone had to be carried off the vessel. So um, this shows a pretty ambitious officer with some steel in his spine. And oh, really? he, uh, he really, uh, he uh, earned some cred on, on this particular <laughs> voyage. Um, Hezeta, by the way, and the other, and Santiago were safe there and cheered the vessel in. Uh, we're very happy to see them. In 1779, four years later, there was another voyage. Quadra was, there were two ships, um, both larger vessels. Quadra was the captain of one. And uh, this, that particular voyage had had three, three objectives. One was to uh, observe the Russians again. The Spanish were very concerned about Russians coming down through Alaska. Um, they were to look for the Northwest Passage and they were to arrest this man, James Cook. <laughs> So James Cook was indeed uh, in the Pacific Northwest at that time. Uh, he was on the thir his third uh, great scientific and mission of exploration. Uh, they, he was looking for the Northwest Passage. Um, he'd, been, he'd had two previous uh, circumnavigations and, and great scientific voyages. So in 1778, um, he had crossed on, on the way to the Northwest, he'd crossed from Hawaii to the North American continent. And in the course of that, they hit some weather and one of his ships, one of his two ships, sprung its mast. And mm -hmm. so they had to put in and do some repairs. So they coasted and uh, came to uh, a, a sheltered cove. It turned out to be Nootka Sound, the same sound that uh, Perez had anchored off of, but not entered and not landed in, uh, four years previously. So... Cook and his two ships uh, uh, went to anchor in the Nootka Sound, protected waters, and proceeded with the refits. The Moachot came to him, and they they engaged. There was a there was a a lot of back and forth. Um, the uh, the Moachot sold them some supplies. They traded back and forth, um, and they were there for a month on these refits. And then the voyage continued. Um, Cook sailed north. Um, he did not get arrested by the Spanish. The Spanish never found him, never encountered him, but he didn't survive the voyage. He died um, a year later in Hawaii uh, in an altercation with the indigenous folks. But I, the, so today's subject is not about James Cook. It's about one of his midshipmen, a 21-year-old um, Englishman from Norfolk named George Vancouver. Uh, and George Vancouver was the son of a minor customs official. He entered the Navy at the age of 13, which was common in those days for a young uh, officer. Doesn't mean they went to sea. They meant uh, they often entered the, the books of a vessel and their, their um, service time began then. We know that he went to sea at the age of 15. He sailed on Cook's second voyage. So he actually sailed on two of Cook's voyage. The... Uh, the second voyage, which was in search of the uh, apocryphal uh, southern continent, which is believed to be far south in the uh, uh, in southern latitudes, and the third voyage, which was in search of the Northwest Passage. Now, Cook, uh, Vancouver was bright, energetic, dutiful, meticulous. Um, he excelled at his training, and we might call him precocious today. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you, there's a, there's an anecdote about his life on that second voyage. They were in the polar region. They um, had been probing for this apocryphal theor theoretical continent for weeks in uh, Arctic weather. And um, they were at 71 degrees South latitude, which is a very, very deep, uh, deep latitude. It's a, it's a deep penetration into the Arctic Circle. This, this voyage was the first one to actually cross the Antarctic Circle. So um, Cook decides we're not finding this continent. It's time to turn around. And so he gives the orders to, to bring the ship around and Vancouver, um, midshipman Vancouver, uh, jumps down off the quarter deck, runs across the main uh, deck, up on the forecastle to the front of the vessel to the uh, the bowsprit, 
And he stands there with the spray and the ice uh, coming down upon him. And he takes his hat off and he waves it in the air. And he turns around to the to the to face the quarter deck and shouts, "Ne plus, ne plus ultra, ne plus ultra," which means nobody farther. Now, <laughs> this is 150 years before Leonard DiCaprio and Kate Winslet <laughs> did their uh, scene on the Titanic. It shows, shows a little bit of uh, spirit on the lad's part. Um, <clears throat> the voyage continued. Um, Cook died, um, other officers brought the vessels home and they returned in 1780. Vancouver was immediately commissioned as a Lieutenant in the Royal Navy. And he went to, uh, to sea immediately, even though he was just back from this voyage because Britain was at war with America and with America's allies, Spain and France. So he went to war, in a, went to sea uh, in the English Channel doing escort and uh, patrol work. His vessel, the sloop of war um, Martin, I believe, yes, Martin, uh, was transferred to the Caribbean station. And so he then found himself in the Caribbean, saw action against the Spanish, and soon was appointed as the fourth lieutenant on a 74-gun vessel, the, the pride of the Caribbean fleet, the, uh, the Fame, HMS Fame. Um, the, war, the war ended in 1783 and fame and Vancouver returned to England. And at that point he began for the first time in years um, uh, to be unemployed. He was, he was now on half pay. The Navy was shrinking. They did not need as many Naval officers as they had. So he had 18 months at home. Um, uh, he hadn't seen his family for years. Um, we don't really know what he did during that period, but, uh, what he did do is secure, um, uh, 18 months later, a posting on um, a posting to the Caribbean station. Uh, he was uh, posted as the fourth lieutenant to HMS Europa, which was the flagship of the Commodore flagship of the Commodore of the uh, of the of the Jamaica station. Now, Jamaica station it was peacetime, but Jamaica station was not a healthy place. There was scurvy. There was yellow fever. There was malaria. Um, there's a. There's the Royal Navy has a toast of the day for each of the days of the week. Yep. They've been somewhat uh, modernized, but uh, the the toast for Thursday back in the day, back in my day, was to a bloody war and sickly season. And this is gallows humor, but it showed how advancement could be secured in the Navy. Uh, your, your chances of promotion are good if there's a war and if people are dying of disease. People, people die, yep. This turned out well for Vancouver because he joined as the fourth lieutenant. Within three years, he was the first lieutenant of the Europa, and he had come to the attention of the Commodore, who's who was an influential uh, um, officer named uh, Alan Gardner, who went on to be in the uh, member of the Board of Admiralty and was was a patron to him in, in his subsequent career. Um, sorry, I, uh, I'll go back to my units. Yeah, so, so uh, 1789, the, um, the posting ended, the Europa returned to Europe, to England, and so did George Vancouver. He was immediately thrown into what became known as the Nootka crisis. So uh, we're getting there. <laughs> this, uh, this is the map that was produced after James Cook's third voyage. And you can see that the coast is starting to look as we recognize it now, but you can see by the dark hedging that uh, etching that th that's been well explored. The rest is kind of a interpolation and you can see those fine lines where no one knew anything was in the high of the Arctic, part of the coast of Alaska, and the mid latitudes between 30 and 60 degrees of uh, uh, down on your bottom left, uh, bottom right corner of this map. Uh, we didn't know what was there. So the, uh, the accounts, uh, the charts were published, the accounts of the, of the expedition were published, and it soon became no, known that if uh, that um, Cook's men, when they were in Nootka Sound for those five months, trading with the Moachot, 
had acquired um, sea otter pelts. Right. And they, on the way back to England, when the voyage, when the expedition in the north was over, they had a station stop in China. And they sold those uh, those pelts that they had bought in Nootka Sound for a 2,000% profit, which are gold rush returns. And when news got out back in England and America of the gold rush returns, it begat a gold rush. Um, it was called the maritime. It was the first start of the, the first uh, step of the maritime fur trade, which um, drew traders from around the world to the Pacific Northwest. And the epicenter of the trade was Nootka Sound. Nootka Sound keeps appearing in, in these accounts. It was a central place. There was an anchorage. It was sheltered waters and um, easy to get to. Um, so what happened was with all these people come in, what Spain had feared for years, foreigners coming into the territory that they claimed was coming to pass. This, this was happening. And they got very concerned. And in, when they they learned about this, it took them um, a while to organize the forces. But in 1789, they sent two ships to, um, to Nootka Sound to, on a sovereignty on a sovereignty mission. So they were not reconnoitering now. Mm. They were um, going to show the flag. They were going to show Spanish strength. They were going to show uh, uh, presence in the area. And they were going to check everybody's papers and documents and make sure that they were there. The Spanish for years had, since time immemorial, they had been very possessive about their property, their um, colonial empire. And they did not like foreigners coming into their territory. <laughs> They had a kind of a, mono, a very much a monopolist approach to uh, controlling the territories that they claimed. Um, so the, this force was led by a Spaniard named um, Jose Esteban Martinez. And uh, he arrived in May of 1789 in Nootka Sound and found three ships. Um, he asked them for their papers, their passports, or whatever documentation they had, inspected them. Um, two of the ships were Americans, and he gave them a pass. The third ship was a Portuguese under Portuguese flag. He looked at the documents, he inspected the ship, and something didn't smell right. It, he believed that they were operating under a flag of convenience and they were a British ship. Right. So, so he seized the ship. Few days later, he um, he released the ship and allowed it to sail for China. So they they got they hightailed it out of there. I'm not entirely sure why um, they did have uh, Portuguese flags and the Portuguese were uh, were allies, but uh, the the circumstances of that are not clear. This was May of 1789, um, June of 1789. Uh, Martinez and his other sister ship continued to check passports. There were traders coming in and out all the time. They would check uh, uh, to see who they were. In July, two British ships arrived. They were uh, led by uh, a British, a former Navy man named James Collett, who had been on Cook's second voyage. He was a, so Vancouver would have known him. After the American War, the Navy had shrunk Many men had gone on to um, half pay, and many of them went into the merchant trade. It was how to make a living. Colnett had done that. He'd been on the coast before. Um, and when Martinez called on him to see his papers, he was evasive. He uh, said, I'll, uh, they're all kind of in a mess. I'll, I'll get back to you. I'll bring them over to you. Um, the, evasive, the evasions continued, and... Uh, they had discussions about Spanish sovereignty on Martin, Martinez's part, and um, Colnett uh, suggested that um, he had a commission from the British king, and it was all uh, it was all very um, uh, evasive on his part. And the discussions became more and more uh, heated. And then this happened. This is uh, the seizure of. The British ships by the Spanish, by Martinez. This is a somewhat romanticized um, uh, uh, painting of this. It makes it look all very noble and uh, wonderful. In, in truth, it was kind of a tawdry affair in, that was conducted in Martinez's cabin. Um, they had an argument. Um, Colnett eventually 
produced his passport, which he said was signed by King George, held it up to him, but wouldn't actually give it to Martinez. <laughs> so uh, Martinez was uh, you know, left at a loss on that. Um, Mar- uh, Colnett had a hot temper. Martinez had a hot temper. Colnett starts uh, stomping and slapping the table. Um, he's shouting. Martinez takes umbrage about the uh, perceived slight he sees to Spain and the Spanish flag and his king mm-hmm. and, and to him himself because he's he's right. receiving, you know, tempers are high. Um, Colnett puts his hand on his sword a couple of times while he's uh, having this discussion. And he utters something like Gardem España, which you can probably translate as goddamn Spain. So um, Martinez has had enough. Uh, a musket goes to Colnett's chest and he's arrested in the cabin. Uh, his crews are arrested and um, Spanish ships are put on the Spanish crews are put on these ships. Um, the Brits are loaded on and they're shipped off to San Blas. So they're they're seized and uh, impounded and off to imprisonment in, in Spain or in New Spain. Uh, just a quick question for you, actually, too. Uh, just to also give you a break from talking here. We got a question. So going back a bit about those maps, is the, the better charted areas reflect a search for the Northwest Passage? Yes, pretty well. Uh, yeah. those, those were areas that um, um, Cook in particular, that third voyage of Cook's had had, uh, right. had had charted. Also, the Russians had done some charting on the Alaska coast as well. And right. there was a lot of sharing between countries. Um the Spanish were kept it close and, you know, for, for truly new discoveries, every country kept it close because they wanted to exploit it in some way. Right. But, but there was some sharing. That makes sense. Uh, and then this painting here, uh, do we know the artist and title? I don't. Uh, I got that off the internet. So mea culpa, I, I did not see the source. Um, but it it's, um, I'll, I'll speak in a few minutes to, this was the start of the Nootka crisis. This this was the incident. Two hot-headed guys going at it in the cabin, putting their hand to the sword and, and insulting uh, the other's country. This is what precipitated this crisis, which which snowballed into um, a war threat, and they came they came that close. So this, I think, probably was produced to show a noble Briton just going about his business, being yeah. um, being in, impeded by. Uh, by foreigners. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was gonna go back to that. Well, yes, that. <laughs> but the whole two-headed, two hot-headed individuals sparking a crisis. This is not the first or last time that happens. <laughs> no, it's not. And and of course, but when it got back to England, I'll, I'll talk about that in just a few minutes. When it yep. got back to England, um, it became a cause celeb, and um, it was <laughs> painted as you know, perfidious uh, Spain uh, go, taking a run at uh, innocent uh, Britons just going about their business. Yep trading in territory that wasn't theirs. <laughs> yep. So um, let me pick up my, my, okay, yeah. So the the ships, which you see on the, on the left side here, you can see Spanish flags actually flying above the British flags. It's showing um, the, uh, the ships were impounded. These two ships were owned by a, a Briton, a, a, an Anglo, an Anglo Englishman named John Mears, who was also an ex-Navy guy. He had traded on the coast in 1786 and 87 in the early days of that um, gold rush that I was talking about. He was one of the first guys in. Um, He had wintered over in in the winter of 86, 87, almost killed his crew in the process, and was back in uh, 88. And he was operating in Nootka Sound in 1788. And he apparently had some kind of shore establishment in uh, in Friendly Cove or uh, in, in the site of the Moachad village, which is called, which they called Yupot. Um, he came back, he, he sailed with a full hold in 17, the fall of 1788, went back to China where all these uh, um, sea otter pelts were sold, um, did quite well and outfitted over the winter, he outfitted these two ships for the sale, for, for the, uh, the trade in the Northwest. He'd been on um, voyage for three years running, and so he hired Colnett to act for him. So uh, that's why Colnett was there with, with his ships. Um, when word reached Mears in China, um, 
some months later about these uh, the impoundment of his vessels, he was ruined. He knew that it was the end of uh, his venture, and he saw one one opportunity to salvage anything out of this, and he he grabbed it. He took the first ship he could get to England, and in the on, on the way he penned a memorandum of grievance, uh, which he would table with the government. Now he arrived in April, I think. Uh, April of 1791, and mm. um, tabled his memo with uh, the government, which was led by William Pitt the Younger, yep. a cagey politician. Now, the news of this uh, was was golden to Pitt because and the government because um, Spain was uh, allied with the the other Bourbon power, France. And France was just going through the early stages of its revolution. And so France was in no state to come to Spain's uh, aid. And so Pitt exchanged notes with the angry notes with the Spanish and said, you've, you've confiscated British property. Um, he also probably stoked public sentiment. So paintings like these were produced right. and, and the, the gutter press and, you know, there, everyone had a newspaper in those days. Um, this was golden news for the press because it sold broadsheets and it all or, or newspapers, but it also um, played into the British public's concern. Spain was a perennial em enemy of the of the English. They had been um, uh, at war for you know <laughs> not continuously but periodically for years and years, and so it kind of played into perfidious Spain, uh, like here they are intruding on honest Britons trying to make a living. So war sentiment grew in, amongst the public and the cabinet um, uh, ordered the mobilization of the fleet. Hmm. This was probably a, um, a bluff on, on Pitt's part, but the press gangs went to work immediately. The ships prepared for war and the ships sailed on a war, on a war um, uh, footing. So uh, the British fleet is at, at sea and the Spanish fleet uh, went out to meet them and they never actually uh, encountered each other because it was in no one's interest really for, to have a war. Spain knew that it was weak and had no allies and Britain didn't want to have the, the, the um, uh, cost of the war. So negotiations actually were launched in Madrid between the uh, a British ambassador and the Spanish prime minister, Count Florida Blanca. And Britain's interest really was um, to secure the right to settle and the right to trade in areas that Spain had had claimed but never occupied. Right. And with Pacific Northwest, case in point. Um, the Falklands also, you know, kind of case case in point. There were there were many touchstones that uh, uh, that this this objective um, uh, applied to. So the negotiations proceeded. Britain was focusing on that interest and the ambassador and the prime minister reached uh, an agreement. It was called the Nootka Convention and it was ambiguous and complicated and just very, very vague. Um, I, I've read it several, many times and and I just can't uh, can't always understand the nuances there. But what Britain secured was an agreement by Spain to return to Britain's the buildings, property, and tracts of land seized by the Spaniards in the Pacific Northwest. So it there was no definition of what those buildings were, what the uh, property was, what the tracts of land were. So it was all very vague. They basically punted it to the future um, in, in a face-saving gesture. And they said two commissioners will be sent uh, one from Spain, one from England, and uh, they will resolve the situation on the Northwest coast. So, um, <clears throat> next slide. Now the Northwest coast, this is Chief McQuinna, uh, who was the chief of the Moachat. And I, I just interpose here, this was not unoccupied territory. It wasn't Spanish territory, it wasn't British territory. It had been occupied by the Moachat for 5,000 years. There's, there's archaeological evidence on site that they and their ancestors were there. So I, I just introduced that um, because in my book, I've 
uh, you know, you could write this story as Spain and England uh, clashing. And I've always thought this is a three-sided story. And the, the right. Mozart and the Indigenous people really do need a, uh, uh, a horse in the race, a dog in the fight. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so the, the Nootka Convention is reached, is achieved, and um, it has to be affected. Now, I bring you back to uh, Vancouver, returned in 1789, uh, was immediately swept up in this war fervor in early 1790. But he was appointed on his return to be the first lieutenant or the second in command of, an, of another voyage of exploration. The details of that were, were not uh, firm when the war scare occurred. But when the war scare did occur, the Spanish armament, he went to sea again. And uh, so did the uh, the man who was to be the captain of the venture, um, Henry Roberts, also a Cook veteran, a veteran of um, Cook's voyages um, with seniority over Vancouver. The war scare ended, Vancouver returned, Roberts was reassigned. And so Vancouver became the leader of this expedition in his stead. That's how Vancouver um, became the Vancouver expedition. Um, Two ships had been secured for the voyage. Uh, on the left, uh, this is a, these are, I'll show you two or three paintings by a fantastic artist named Steve Mayo, who's, uh, who lives in Washington and, and uh, does ships. On the left is uh, Discovery. It's a three-masted bark, which is two masts are uh, square rigged and the aft mast, the mizzen is uh, fore and aft. Um, so the, the Discovery was 330 tons launched in 1789. It was built as a merchant ship and acquired by the Navy. And it was 100 feet from stem to stern. And its crew was 100 men. So cozy, very cozy, especially when outfitted for a voyage of, uh, of four years. So um, that's shipboard living in the 18th century. The Chatham, the consort ship, smaller vessel, also uh, newly built, was a brig of 131 tons. A brig is a a two master with um, fore and aft, sail, uh, sorry, square square rating sails. Um, the Discovery had ten guns, four pounders, not big guns, and ten swivels. This was not a warship. This was not a rated vessel. This was uh, this was a doughty sailor, a, a good uh, a good hardy uh, ship for the voyage. Um, Chatham was. Uh, was a smaller vessel and and not nearly as uh, solid as Discovery. So details of the of the voyage were finalized after the crisis. And Vancouver's mission was to proceed to the northwest and fill in that gap I was talking about on the coast. He was to chart the uh, North American coast from thirty degrees latitude, which is the the you know southern uh, mid California or uh, maybe northern California to Cook Inlet in Alaska, which is 60 degrees. 30 degrees of latitude is a huge swath of territory. They thought it would take two years. In practice, it took three years, plus the getting there and the coming back. So it was an epic, uh, epic voyage. Um, but that was his, his hydrographic mission. But almost as an add-on, the Admiralty and the, and the government assigned him to be the commissioner to the Nootka Convention. So he was the British commissioner who would go and receive these tracts of land and property that had been seized by the Spanish. The details were few. He was to proceed there and transact with the Spanish commissioner. Um, it was all very vague. And the, the people in London assured him that um, further details would be provided to him. There was a, um, a supply ship that was being sent out called the Daedalus which would rendezvous with his two ships in Hawaii. They would have uh, dispatches which would tell Vancouver what he needed to do as commissioner. But when Vancouver got to Hawaii, Daedalus didn't show up. And so he sailed for, uh, he had to, because the, you know, the clock was running on his voyage, he couldn't wait. He sailed for the Pacific Northwest in, uh, in early 1792 and arrived off the coast of California in April. Um, near Cape Mendocino. Um, yeah, so it took them a year to get to the Pacific coast and, uh, and they arrived in April. They sailed up the coast. Um, let me just go 
this this hopefully will help your readers. So they sailed up the coast from California, reached uh, the Olympics and and uh, the uh, um, the mouth of Juan de Fuca, which is I can't point at it, but uh, you can see Puget Sound there. Um, they got to the mouth of the Juan de Fuca, and they were a hundred miles from Nootka Sound. He didn't have instructions. He was supposed to deal with the Spanish, but he chose to prioritize his hydrographic mission. It was the beginning of the year. He couldn't waste time, um, didn't know how long this would take. So he turned into the Strait of Juan de Fuca, sailed down it, charting the way, uh, was the first, uh, his, his people were the first Europeans to enter Puget Sound and to chart it um, in the month of June. They sailed up the Sailor Sea. They, you can see the, the divide between the mainland and the large island on the left. They uh, they chartered all these fjords and they did it. They did it. <laughs> Please bear with me. Yeah, no worries. They they did it um, in small boats because yeah. it was so heavily uh, indented, fjorded. Um, there were currents they didn't understand. There were uh, navigational hazards, reefs, and whatnot. So uh, his methodology was very meticulous. Um, they would go to a safe anchorage where they knew the ships could be safe. They would um, send off, um, here's another picture by Steve Mayo. They would send off um, launches from the boats with 10 men each, um, two from Chatham, two from Discovery. Um, they would take different uh, fjords and they would go and uh, spend 10 days in the boats. So these boats would have uh, 10 men Wow. They'd have weapons. They'd have their food for ten days. They'd have uh, sextant and uh, plumb lines and uh, compasses and so on. Um, tight and cozy, I think, and exposed <laughs> to the elements. Um, I did show you the the previous one. Um, they did rig them with masts to to assist when uh, when conditions uh, were favorable. So that's how they did their voyage, and they 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 spent the summer of 1792 navigating up that inside passage. The island on the left that I showed you is known today as Vancouver Island. Vancouver did not name it after himself, but there's a story about how it became Vancouver Island and he and he had a role in it. Um, I'll save that, save my thunder. But at the end of the summer, they, they turned the corner of Vancouver Island, sailed down, and he was ready to start dealing with the Spanish in Nootka Sound. When he arrived in Nootka Sound, this, this is the village of Uquat or Friendly Cove at, at the mouth of Nootka Sound. This is the village that he knew in 1785. They spent a month uh, anchored across the way um, off Bly Island where they were doing their repairs and they came frequently to this village to, to get supplies and for, for diplomatic meetings with the indigenous folk. This is what he expected to see. This is what he found. A Spanish settlement with a presidio, uh, barracks, um, uh, storerooms, um, a forge. There were clearings for um, and fenced areas for agriculture, and there was uh, grazing areas. A lot of the forest had been cleared. And at the mouth of the harbor, there was a Spanish fort, which bristled with cannon and uh, was defended by Spanish warships and a garrison of uh, 200 Spaniards. Wow. So um, Vancouver arrives and it's not the world he knew 14, 14 years ago. And all of these uh, Spaniards were led by Bodega y Quadra, who was a formidable, as we've seen, a formidable, formidable officer. Now, oops, sorry. So that's, uh, that's the setup for my book. Um, and, and just to, to kind of, I've set it up. Um, the historical figure, the historical characters, then um, Vancouver still needed to uh, fulfill his duties as the commissioner. He also had been at sea for 18 months, so he needed to refit his ships and resupply them and get ready to go back to sea again because the winter in the Northwest um, was, was very harsh. Mm -hmm. I mentioned how Mears nearly killed his uh, crew yeah. by wintering over. So the plan was for Vancouver to and his ships to winter in Hawaii, which sounds pretty cool. I, I know that. But um, they 
uh, he, he they would winter there, replenish there again, and also his task he had been mandated by the Admiralty to um, to chart the archipelago of the Hawaiian Islands as well. So he had a full winter ahead of him. Um, he expected that the diplomacy was. Uh, thank you for giving me back these properties and tracts of land and uh, and so on. That was those were the instructions he had. There'd been no clarification on those goals, but Quadra, this formidable Spaniard, had other ideas, and um, they then entered into negotiations. They were supposed to resolve the Nootka crisis, but for the month they were there, they had negotiations back and forth, which. Um, which were difficult. And while they were having these negotiations, deep in the footnotes of the histories that I was reading about this, there was always mention of um, a murder. There was a murder occurred in the port and the um, indigenous people were immediately blamed for it, but it was there was never any solution. So when I saw this, with all this history behind it, I thought I'm writing a novel, not history, this is my story. And so this this is at the core of the focal point of the wind from all directions is with all this diplomacy going on and the navigation and exploration, um, I thought, isn't that interesting that we have these, the Spanish and the British and the indigenous all coming together and there's a murder. So how did that, how did that resolve? So that's all I have to say about, uh, <laughs> I hope there's some questions. Yeah, there is. Uh, sorry, that was a great um, teaser. <laughs> uh, in in road, I don't know what to call it. That that was fantastic. Sorry, I just spelled on by all these different moving parts and and how you're able to keep all this straight because I know, like you said, I think we we're talking about the, the the settlement or the convention. How it's confusing language. I think that goes for most of this time period when it comes to this diplomatic stuff, right? Nobody's trying to give too much of an inch, and everything is left ambiguous on purpose and obviously that causes all kinds of uh, issues so yeah if anybody has any the questions were high, for sure the stakes were high. They were imperial powers and uh and even the stakes for the mochad and the indigenous people were extremely high as as we understand today yeah i'll just say uh if anybody has any questions uh go ahead uh there's a few here sorry i don't, I don't know if you know this one but uh question from James here is uh, so the maps that Cook made maybe the one that we were looking at before that they fit almost over the Google Maps is that is that accurate to say that they were fairly on the mark here you know they uh, latitude was always easy to uh, to determine longitude was a problem for navigators in those days so if there's any divergence it would probably be on the longitude side Cook's, uh, Cook's maps were excellent. Uh, Vancouver's maps were excellent as well. Um, uh, but I, I don't know how close they, they chart to Google. Uh, that's that's a very high standard. <laughs> yeah, well, satellite mapping helps quite a bit. So yeah. I think you mentioned this, but I'm just double checking here. Um, is high, hydrography, is that how it's pronounced? Hydrography, is that what was being practiced to do this? Yeah, it's it's the the charting of, uh, of, of oceanscapes. Yes, um, that was it. Yeah. Uh, and Patrick O'Brien and uh, I mean they they had the same skill set skill set as the historical characters Cook and uh, and Quadra and Vancouver. Yeah, that's not an area um, I know much about <laughs> the the fictional uh, books. Not really my area, but uh, I've always heard they're very interesting. And of course, Master and Commander gets brought up. Uh, well, I, I, <laughs> I've, I've read a number of those because uh, I, I kind of I struggled with. How do I make my characters uh, speak? Like, what what dialogue is useful, which uh, which won't lose a 21st century reader? And uh, right. so I've I've read I've read uh, Billy Budd, and I've read uh, very <laughs> widely to try to figure out and make my decisions because ultimately it's the writer's decision about how they handle that challenge. Right. And before I forget, everything is linked down below to get the book, and it's done quite well on um, Amazon. Uh, uh, both Canada and in the U.S. currently, uh, very high rank. So check it out, uh, and the links uh, are down there for anyone who wants to look at this story. I can't think of a better inroad or a way to get you excited to read fiction on all uh, uh, historical fiction. Sorry, than than that. Um, so a question here from from David, one of our supporters, and we'll be on the channel next weekend. Uh, what is the impact, or as best as you can tell, of, of the First Nations due to maybe some of these voyages, of, or of anything of this time period? Yeah. So on the on the coast, um, 
the the Moachat became middlemen in in acquiring furs um, because all the traders were coming into their territory. Right. Um, so they they did very well, and it diverted them from um, their traditional uh, activities, which they were whaling people. And so for a, a time in the early 1790s, they the um, they missed the whaling season. It, they okay. were just doing so well with this trade. Right. Um, it brought prosperity and it brought trade goods, and everyone wanted trade goods. Um, right. They you know especially metal. Um, the downside of that other than undermining their traditional um, practices. The downside was the people, the traders who came were a rough bunch. It was a gold rush and uh, bad folks uh, tend to accompany uh, yeah. uh, those type of things. So the, the Spanish Navy, for example, in the early days, they were not led by senior officers and they were, uh, they were, they f created a, an establishment at the mouth of Nootka Sound and um, they they found lots of lumber because the indigenous people uh, created their lodges and then um, moved several times a year from their winter uh, base to their summer base and they floated a lot of the logs um, to to rebuild where they came but they left a lot behind so the ones they left behind the Spaniards just uh, repurposed for their construction so. They, uh, there was some destruction and some uh, what the indigenous would call theft of, um, of the things that didn't belong to them. There were thefts of uh, furs. Uh, the fur traders in the early days, um, they bought very cheaply. Mm. Eventually, people discover that what they're selling is worth more. And so the price went up. The indigenous people were asking more for um, sea otter pelts. And uh, some of the traders who had been there in previous years came back and said, oh, I can't believe it. This is, this is hyperinflation. And so they took matters into their own hands. And if they didn't like the price, sometimes they just stole them. Right. Sometimes they, um, um, they took hostages. Um, right. They, uh, and you know, the, these hostage taking incidents usually ended badly for the, uh, the indigenous people. There were a lot of people killed. And so that, that was, um, that was the most deleterious thing was people died because there was no law and order. The, the year that Quadra arrived, uh, the Spanish had been there for four years, three years, but in 1792, Quadra arrived and he was very successful in introducing order and discipline amongst his own people and, and gained a lot of respect uh, from the indigenous and from the traders because of that. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. And it sounds like the, the picture that you've painted, that that would be fitting to his character, um, what he was trying to do there. Um, again, another one more related towards the uh, indigenous people, but was there accounts maybe even from the Europeans of the effects of the diseases? Because you said this was one of the first contact, well, this is the first contact that we know of, prior, obviously in the years prior, but was there any notes on this at all? Um, there was, so usually we think of... Um, uh, tuberculosis and smallpox. Uh, I don't see anything in those uh, in the 18th century about tuberculosis and smallpox. I do see venereal diseases being introduced. Oh. And, you know, the seamen, the sailors who arrived in these uh, were, you know, had been in ports all over the world and they, uh, there was no cure for venere venereal disease at the time. And so they carried venereal disease and, and spread it uh, uh, wherever they were. Yeah, I mean, again, not surprising, given the, like you said, the lifestyle, I guess you could call it, of the time. Yes, yes. Uh, so question for me, and we talked about this a little bit, you and me, but kind of wondering with this book and, you know, all the research and everything that you, you've done into this and you mentioned the anniversary, is there anything uh, other than the book selling very well, <laughs> which we're trying to help you do, and I'm sure we've got some new readers here, of... You know, is there a bigger goal here that you have in mind of, of, of what you're trying to do with this story? Are you trying to get this time period better known, that there's the different relations going on here? Is, is there something like that you have in mind? I do want these incidents to be better known. I, you know, I'm not an historian, but I'm a history wonk. And so I discovered these incidents. Um, I was completely unaware of, of the kinds of incidents that I, I described to you today, the nuclear right. crisis, the background. Uh, until I began uh, doing the research for this book. And 
So I would like people in the Pacific Northwest and people in Canada, I, I'm just speaking for my, my own country, to be aware of, of these issues and these characters um, because uh, the characters Quadra, Vancouver, and I would, I would include um, uh, Maquina as well, the uh, chief of the Mochat, were extraordinary characters dealing with extraordinary events. And they're, uh, they're hardly known. The, if you go to the Pacific Northwest, look at Puget Sound, look at Mount Baker, uh, look at uh, uh, Vancouver Island and uh, Galliano and Valdez. These are all names of the people who, who first explored and, uh, and, and uh, f discovered for European people. Right. The indigenous people uh, had names for these features, but they were the first people to come in and uh, and uh, and left their legacy behind. Uh, there are tons of Spanish names uh, yeah. all the way up and down the Pacific coast, and uh, and inside uh, uh, inside the waters of the Salish Sea, uh, there's all these names. Um, the Spanish, the English ambassador who who negotiated with Count Florida Blanca was named uh, Fitzherbert, and he was. Uh, uh, the British art government was so happy with what he what he accomplished that he was made Baron uh, uh, St. Helens. So Mount St. Helens was yeah. named by George Vancouver for him. Vancouver didn't know that it was going to pop 200 years later. But, yeah. uh, so all these names, uh, I, I am fascinated with the, the connections. And I would hope as someone writing historical fiction that people might get a little bit of the fire in their belly that I have as well. <laughs> that's the that's always our goal right to get more more interest and more people just I into this stuff and, and different time periods and i think you've uh, done a pretty good job covering this so so thanks for coming around it's uh it's uh greatly appreciated oh one more question here um uh, from james again is there are you aware of anything in the area i know it's more toward the world north with what becomes today as known as alaska but russian influence in this area at all is there any incursions into the vancouver area vancouver island area at all that you're aware of uh, not that I'm aware of. Um, I, I just became aware last year. There's there's a place in California called Russian River, and um, after the period that I've been looking at, um, the Russians did get down that far into into that latitude for a short period of time. Um, I know nothing else about that other than uh, I was surprised that they had come so far because um, on Cook's second voyage, they did encounter Russians way up uh, on Alaska on the Alaska side and on the Russian side. They uh, uh, but I was unaware that they had come that far south. The Spanish were always worried about the Russians coming down, though, and right. that was the uh, you know the the Russian bear coming down was their greatest fear. Yeah, some things uh, never change, as they say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that has not changed at all. Yeah, so uh, that's good. Everyone's uh, loving it. Great feedback here. And uh, sorry, I'm just trying to find the one comment here about. Uh, yeah, here we go. Pretty good history for a novelist and pretty good novelist for a historian. So we got both ways going. Here. I'd say that's that's uh, fantastic history work that you've done and and trying to bring and not trying accomplishing such a complicated time period. I tried to do it in my own head when we first started talking about all this. I just couldn't do it. I'm like, Brown, I'll do it. It'll be fine. Because <laughs> I just know there's so many different conflicts that are you know parallel to this and that's when i get confused because you got the american revolution and then you're on the cusp of you know the Amer french revolution and all the napoleonic stuff and then spain and britain are fighting and then they're allies it's just it's a, it's a <laughs> so anyway so uh, thanks for coming on Did you enjoy coming on our channel and uh, hanging out with us this afternoon thank you it was fun that's great it's great to hear so uh thanks everyone again check out the links down below uh for ron's book uh, it's all linked up there you can get it um and it's good stuff and if you can become a supporter of my channel so we can keep kind of these live streams going and different uh, topics and hopefully more more support i have the more we can do and have people like ron on to talk about all different kinds of topics so links down for that as well and uh you can become a youtube channel member as well and help me out keep this going so other than that uh, everyone have a good uh, rest of your day afternoon where uh, wherever you're joining from us and uh Next weekend, we got quite a bit of live streams coming. So check all those out, and I'll post that all over the place for everybody to know for that coming next weekend. So I'll see everybody next time. Have a good rest of your day, everybody. Bye.